It's a, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, just an announcement for housekeeping's sake. I don't know if you were here earlier. Um, the bathrooms in the back are locked. Um, so if you have an emergency, use a tree. No, um, we're, uh, the KC Hall is unlocked still. So if you need to use the restroom, you can just excuse yourself that way. Also, at the end of the talk, we're going to go into a, a time of adoration. Um, during that time of adoration, Bishop and Father Greg and myself will be available for confessions. So I think Bishop will probably be in the confessional. Father Greg will probably be camped out in that back corner somewhere. And I'll be camped out in this front corner here. Uh, if you come to me, I'm going to have to stop at some point to do benediction. So I'm just giving you a heads up. That way you don't think I'm walking out on you. Uh, you are savable. Don't worry. Uh, so, so I want to just begin first. Uh, let's begin with a quick prayer. Uh, and then we'll jump into our talk for tonight. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good and gracious God, we come before You today as men. Men crying out to You, asking for You to strengthen us, to protect us, to lead us. As we do our best to protect, to strengthen, and to lead others. We ask Your blessings upon our, each one of us here, each one of our families, as we continue in our call to be men of You. Men firstly sold out for a life with You. Revealing You to those around us. We come to You through our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with Thee. Blessed art Thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of Thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, as you heard, my name is Father J.D. Mathern. Uh, I am the Associate Pastor at Sacred Heart. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a blessing uh, to be plugged into the community there. I'm also working with the students here at Holy Rosary. Um, so it seems like every other Friday or so I get to come here and just get to be really, really rambunctious like a big kid that I am with all of the kids on, on Mass on Friday. So tomorrow, actually, I'm sure I'm going to find some kind of fun, loud way. Right, Mr. Leonard? I saw you here. Uh, I'm going to find some loud, fun way to try and make the kids excited about the Lord. Well, tonight, as we come uh, as men, hopefully we do the same thing. Right? Hopefully we come here tonight in a fun, exciting, masculine way to experience our Lord so that we can bring Him home with us. Today, today if you haven't noticed, uh, it's hard to grow up. It's a harder time to grow up today than it ever has been in any time in history. I am convinced. And if you, if you question that, I begin first by asking you, have you ever been called a bigot? Have you ever been called a sexist or anything like that for using the wrong pronouns with a person? Using the wrong gender pronouns when you speak to a person? Our young people today on college campuses, our young people today that are growing up in high school in a social media kind of world, that's a daily occurrence for them. It's a hard thing to grow up today. It's a hard thing not only to grow up, but to raise someone today in that kind of climate. And if you're a young father, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Today, it seems like men, it seems like manhood has kind of been thrown on the back burner as compared to past generations. If we rewind about 200, 300 years in our country's history, right, and we go back to the time of the Revolutionary War, there were 14, 15, and 16 year olds who were leading ships during the Revolutionary War. George Washington himself, at 17 years old, led a group of troops against the French. Now, I'm, I'm 29 as of yesterday. My dad, when I was 14, didn't let me start the lawnmower. What happened? <laughs> I, was, I, asked my, I remember point blank being 13 years old and asking my dad. I actually had to ask my dad if I could go mow the grass. That's already kind of crazy. But I asked my dad, Dad, can I go mow the grass? And his response was, look, I do it in a particular way. Let me go make a couple of rounds first in the yard, 
and then you can cut the rest. My mom, my mom to this day will still laugh at my dad. And he said, you left, him a, you left him a piece that's about as wide as this aisle. He did it in two passes and he felt like he mowed the grass. But in reality, we don't trust our younger generation with basic kind of things the same way that it has happened in past generations. Like manhood has been kind of dumbed down over the course of years and years and years and generation after generation. Ultimately, though, I think we can, com- we can come to a very, very, uh, we can come to a very, very clear understanding, kind of a universal truth in a man's life, that all of us need three things. I'm stealing this from a Protestant author named John Eldr- El- uh, Eldridge, if anybody's ever heard of him. He wrote a book called Wild at Heart, and in it he, sta- he says that we need three things for all men to feel alive, to feel that passion in our hearts. The first, we all need an adventure. The second, we all need a beauty. And the third, we all need a battle. Now if we think about this, if we think that we need a, we need a, a beauty, a battle, in an adventure to really be sparked in our, in our faith, in our life, in our family, whatever it is, then no wonder that when men, all of us, come into Mass and we don't know what's going on, we don't really pay attention, we kind of haphazardly do it, that we could probably look from the altar and if we really look at the faces of the men in church, the overall kind of feeling you get when you see a man's face in church is that they're bored. Like men in our Christian world today are just kind of bored. We come to church because we're supposed to. We come to church because if I didn't go to church as a kid, then I didn't eat at my grandmother's house after. Right? If I didn't go to church in high school or in college, and I had to come and face my mom, I was going to get slapped. But if we're not investing anything, if we're not being fed in our hearts with that adventure, that beauty, and that battle, then we're going to be bored. So today, let's break open those three things. Let's break open those three places of a man's heart. And let's see if God can knock if God can fulfill those spaces. The first one. If we think of an adventure, whenever I think of this this idea of an adventure, I remember there was a couple of times, there's only a handful, that I remember getting in trouble when I was a kid. Well, there's a lot of times I got in trouble as a kid, but for this particular thing, um, we lived right on the bayou side. So we had the levee that kind of went down into the bayou, now up in Raceland, right? So we would, I remember being a kid and like having my BB gun and walking along the levee and kind of jumping over branches and dig, like kind of sliding under stuff and just kind of working my way through stuff and I have like my BB gun hanging off my back, thinking like I'm in a war movie. I want to go waist deep in the water and put the gun over my head, you know, like, like I'm just, it, it, it was something about it that like my imagination was, was active. I had an adventure to try and get from one side to the other side and I had my gun just in case I came across something. Man, I felt, like a, I felt like a superhero, you know? I was all excited. We need some kind of adventure to kind of, to kind of really spark that, that desire in our heart. To really get at that fire in our heart. So what is our adventure in the church? What's a very plain, kind of, it probably sounds boring, But our adventure in the church is living a holy life as a layperson. Now, what do I mean? When we're talking about living a holy life as a layperson, like the whole idea of being a layperson in the world today seems scary. The whole idea of trying to be a Catholic person in my workplace, in my family, in the in Walmart, in the at the hunting camp, whatever it is at the tailgate, 
seems like, man, that's, that's too hard. That's the, that's, those are areas that don't, they don't get the Catholic piece. Like those areas, no, 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 that's, that's beyond the church. We don't, we don't worry about that. The idea and the identity of the lay people in the church, I'm going to do a real quick little breakdown of this for you, is that we as priests, we consecrate the bread and the wine every Sunday, every day, to God on behalf of the people, right? Agreed? I think everybody's we're on, we're on part with that. The same way that the priest consecrates the bread and the wine here on the altar every day for the church, the layperson consecrates the world to God. You have the power to consecrate your little slice of the world to God. There was a, there was a cardinal, there's a cardinal, his name's Cardinal Orenzi. He's from, he's from Africa. And one of the ways he explains this, he says, when he's talking about the layperson, he says, those who by baptism are incorporated into Christ and are sent to witness to Christ in the secular sphere. Those who are chosen by baptism, raise your hand in this church if you're baptized. Okay? Who are, who are incorporated into Christ through your baptism, whether you know it or not, you are another Christ. You are called to be another Christ. At, what's the last words that are said at every Mass? Go and announce the Gospel of the Lord. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Go. Get out. Go. And where are you going? To the secular order. The secular sphere. The day-to-day world. Every, one of, every single Catholic, every single baptized person is commissioned at the end of every Mass to go. Now, I know as a kid, I'm walking across the levee and I've got all the trees and I've got my little gun and I've got all my stuff, right? I didn't know what was around the next stump. I didn't know what was the next thing coming up. My imagination is engaged. I'm all excited. I'm having fun. But I didn't know what the next bump in the road was going to be. I didn't know when I was going to turn a corner and there might be a snake. I didn't know if it was going to be easy or if it was going to be hard. When you're sent at the end of Mass to go, you don't know if the next phone call is going to be a child sick or mom and dad are sick. You don't know if the next thing that you come across is going to be a struggle for you. You don't know if the next day is going to hold blessings or if it's going to hold trials. Every one of us, day in and day out, or on an adventure with God. We have an adventure right in front of us. And sometimes we miss it. We're being called to be holy in the day-to-day world. Now, I don't know about you, but in movies, I remember watching it and thinking like, man, it's the good guys. That's who I want to cheer for. It's always the good team, right? The team that's not wearing black. Or the, the, the cowboy who doesn't have the black hat right? We are coming up day in and day out with those with black hats. With the team that's, that's a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. And we're there with our BB gun. And that's all we got. But we cheer for the good guy. We're called in our day-to-day life to be that good guy. To be that, that light in darkness. To be that salt of the earth. To be that yeast, that little bit of yeast that affects the whole bread. See, lay holiness, being a holy lay person, isn't just having 17 different jobs that you do every Sunday. Man, I'm an usher, I'm an acolyte, I give communion, I read, and I do. That's not what lay holiness is. Lay holiness is being able to walk into your office building. And be the same person that you were on Sunday in your pew 
on Monday at your desk. Lay holiness is being a student who's willing to not do X, Y, and Z because I know deep down God's calling me to more. Lay holiness for each one of us is loving a wife or a child whenever they don't deserve it. Each one of us is called in that way to be holy in the world. See, this is the, this is the setting. Like This gives us the background of what it looks like to really dive into that adventure. So think about one, just one example. Family life. Just being a dad, being a husband. Seems menial. Seems boring, right? And when you kind of step back and think about, like, you can kind of think about it as like, what do you do? Oh, I'll do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. But, but deep down, if we think about being a dad, there's nothing more noble. There's nothing that's, that causes and that can have a bigger impact than to be able to form somebody from diapers till they're grown up. Like to be able to walk with an individual and form them and make them into a better young person. Like if we really think about it, this adventure, like we don't, we, sometimes we kind of second guess the influence that we can have on another person. This influence that we can have on a family as a man. The Swiss government did a study from 1994 to 2000. And during that time, it's a little bit dated, but the data is very, very uh, relevant to us. The, the way that they did this, they were trying to see what was the influence of a father on his family, particularly in his faith, like in their faith practices. And they said if the mom and dad were regular ch churchgoers together, their child had a 33% chance to be a regular churchgoer as well. 41% of the kids reported that they kind of went and didn't, but it wasn't very consistent. 33%, one-third of the kids because, that had a mom and a dad who went every week to Mass or to their church service, right? The kid also did the same. One-third. If only the mom was a regular churchgoer, Roughly two to three percent were regular churchgoers when they grew up. So you have the power of 30 percent of the next generation. You have the power and the witness, just the strength in your witness as a father for a third of the next generation of Catholics. Like we're working, we're working with something that's nuclear here when it comes to this adventure, when it comes to this life of holiness, when it comes to continuing to strive and to be that witness out in the world. But I think, I'll, I'll steal something from Spider-Man, um, with great power comes great responsibility. That when we're given that kind of a power just by who we are as men, that we have a responsibility to put it to the best use possible. The second thing that everyone needs is a beauty. Right? Everybody needs, every man needs some beauty to have, to hold. And richer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, every man, I died, every man needs a beauty. Our entertainment world proves this to us. Romeo had Juliet, Robin Hood had made Marion, Mickey had Minnie, Han has Layla, or Leia, I'm sorry, Leia, not an Eric Clapton song. Um, Kermit has Miss Piggy. Mario has the princess. 
Jim has Pam if you're an Office fan. I'm sorry if you're not. Corey has Topanga if you're a Boy Meets World fan. Our entertainment world shows that every man needs a beauty. Now, this isn't just something that's like, man, I, I need a woman in my life to keep me in line, Rodney Ducey. Um, this, isn't, this isn't something that's like, just as, like a sidekick that we need. Right? The picture that St. Paul paints in Scripture for the need for a beauty is something so much bigger than this. In Ephesians 5, Ephesians chapter 5, he says, As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed Himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by both water and the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference of Christ and the church. Now usually whenever this, this Scripture is read, it's at, a, it's at a wedding, right? And at a wedding, the second that the Word says, women, be subordinate to your husbands, that's usually the spot that I look around the church because there's bound, there's bound to be five guys in the congregation that do this. They nudge their lady. They look at her and go, you got to listen to me. But the problem is, they miss their homework. They miss what, what, what it is that St. Paul is saying. So right after the nudge, St. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed Himself over for her to sanctify her. What does that mean? How did Christ love the church? It's right there. Handed Himself over for her to sanctify her. He gave Himself up for her that He could present her to God without spot or blemish or any such thing. Like imagine that image for a moment of being at the end of your life with your wife holding her in your arms walking up to the gates of heaven, laying her down at St. Peter's feet and saying, I've kept her clean. She's ready. And turning right back around to go be purified ourselves. There's no more masculine image. On top of that, what woman, I've asked a lot of women this, what woman does not want to live and follow and be subordinate, as the Scripture says, to a man who's willing to love her like that. This is what we're all called to do when it comes to a life with a beauty. Now, you say, I say this and you're probably looking at me like, wait, but you sing, but like, you're single. You're a priest. What up with you? If you want to know what it looks like for a priest, that same image of walking up and presenting someone without spot and blemish, myself, Bishop, and Father Greg, when we walk up, we just got a whole lot of people. Our job is to lay down our life for the church as a whole and to present the church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It should cause us to all kind of walk up with fear and trembling like, am I doing what I'm called to do? Am I doing, am I loving the way that God is inviting me to love? And ultimately, am I being, in this way, am I being the man that I'm supposed to be? You know, in every, in every Mass, a a, one of my teachers in the seminary taught used this image one time and I was floored. He said in every Mass, the most masculine words that we can possibly say 
of the words of consecration. This is my body, given up for you. In all of Scripture, the most feminine words we can possibly say, the words of every disciple, is, do, is let it be done unto me according to your word. If we live our lives with that consecration kind of mind, if we live our lives saying, Lord, every day let me live those words. Let me live that words of consecration. That this is my body given up for you. That we live with the sacrificial love in mind. Then that cross, that example, gets enfleshed in us. That cross, that example, is, becomes our mission statement as men. And ultimately, that cross lets us live that beautiful image. Let us be, let, let's us serve as small images to the world of Christ's love for them. This is what we're, we're all called to in some way or another. The last way, the last thing that every man needs, a battle. I'm convinced that in our world today, one of the biggest battles that we're going to face is trying to live our life with that as its mission. There was once a story uh, that I've heard that a priest had said on his ordination day. Now, if you've never been to an ordination, at one point, the, the men to be ordained priest lay down face first and basically just, it's, an, it's a physical expression of what's going on. They're laying down their lives for the church. And the entire church at this time is praying for them. And it's a beautiful, beautiful moment in every ordination. But one priest had said, on the day of my ordination, I laid down my life. And every day since, I've had to fight the temptation to go take it back. On the day of a, on the day of a wedding, every groom is willing to lay down his life for his bride. And then the next day, the marriage starts. The next day, she wakes up and that makeup that was so pretty when she was walking down the aisle, about half of it's on the pillow. The other half is in a towel in the bathroom. And she don't look like that no more. When she, she, when she sits up in the bed, her hair that was so perfectly fixed and every hair was in the perfect spot is in about 700 different ways. Looking down, you got a nice drool pill, you got a nice drool puddle forming right by her pillow. This is why we made sure to close it off. <laughs> and then she looks and says, Honey, I love you so much. And you look at her and say, Good God, girl, go brush your teeth. <laughs> at that point, the beauty of the wedding, the trappings of the wedding, the music, the dress, the flowers, all of that is pointless. It's over. It's done. It's a moment. And now all of a sudden, welcome to the rest of your life. This is where you see what the groom is really made of. Whenever you're willing to love past, the trapping's not being there. The music not being perfect. The hair not being in a perfect place. And some stinking breath. <laughs> See, every one of us <coughs> is called at some way to live a life that's going to have a battle. If we want to live for good, we're going to have to fight bad in every one of our lives. Our culture, if you look around, we have we got all kinds of ways that a man can be tempted. But a few of them. Think of the sin of pride. It's so easy 
for us at times to be consumed completely with my world. To, be, to fall into that me monster. It's me. Mine. Me. Somebody else comes to us with the problem, I don't care. It's me. Self-absorbed, narcissistic, whatever we want to call it. Sometimes it's hard to break out of that kind of, that kind of holy navel-gazing that it's all about me and to get us outside of ourselves. When you think of another one, greed. There's a movie, uh, the 1980s movie, Wall Street, right? They came out with a, they came out with, a, um, with Gordon Gecko and all that. They came out with a sequel about, about 10 years ago or so. And it was called Wall Street Never Sleeps. And at one point during the movie, the, one of the characters looks at another one and says, look, what's your number? He says, what's your number? Like, at what point have you gotten enough money that you're willing to just stop, put it down, and walk away because you've made enough? And the guy kind of stands there for a second, thinking. And he looks at him and he says, you want to know my number? More. How many men, and if I'm talking to you, it's okay. But how many of us can get locked in to my job being what I'm married to? My, fo my entire focus of my life being work. The entire focus of my life being that I want that paycheck to be more. I think, it's a, I think it's a fair thing for us to look just at the world around us and to take it and kind of, kind of reflect on it ourselves. Am I there? Is my, what's my number? Is it more? Sloth. It's another one of the deadly sins. A world that has all of the knowledge of the world at our fingertips. More, more than any culture in the past has ever wanted to know or could know is at our fingertips every single day. And I don't know about you, but I've walked into houses and I've seen days that a dad has his kid playing around in the living room and is mindlessly just tapping away on an iPad. Games, shopping, surfing the internet. Just mindlessly. Kids playing, doing, Dad, look! Oh yeah, not paying attention. A laziness that can settle in. A stagnant kind of feeling that can just kind of fester. How often is it that we fall into this just kind of sloth? And the big one that seems like our culture is absolutely enthralled with, lust. You know, Jesus said, when, if, we, if we look at a woman with lust, We've committed adultery with her in our heart. There's a lot of adultery being ha happening in the hearts of men in the world today. And I don't say that as condemnation, but just as fact. And if we look at it, we can see that in all of these cases, whether it be greed, whether it be pride, whether it be lust, whatever it is, that there's not a wanting to give in our life but it gets flipped around and we take. I think the biggest battle for men to live in our, in our world today is not just against these, little th these, against these sins. Not just in, in the day-to-day, -day, in the trenches, that these sins can pop up. But I think the biggest thing is for us as men to lose giving and give it up for the opportunity to take. That's what, that's what pornography looks like. I don't give anything, but I get to take everything. That's what, 
That's what a life being, being married to a job looks like. I don't give anything to the people that need it. I just take for more. Each one of us is called not to take. Each one of us, by, by virtue of being a man, is called to give. And to give, and to give, and to give until it hurts. To be stripped of everything, to lay it down, and to let it go for someone else. If we look at the Scriptures, if we look at the history of our church, there have been many examples of what real men look like. And quite honestly, when you, walk, when you drive up and down this bayou, when you come into churches like this, you see what real men look like. But coming from us, going all the way back to Jesus' time, we see example after example in our church of what real men look like who are willing to live an adventurous life. A life that's completely oriented and focused on a beauty. And willing and ready to fight when necessary in a battle. One for example, St. Joseph. If we look at St. Joseph, he had an adventure, to say the least. Angel, he's betrothed to this young woman. An angel shows up and says, uh, in a dream and says, by the way, she's, uh, she's pregnant. Now Joseph knows he didn't do it. She's pregnant. And it's, it's God's child. If you think about the adventure that he was thrown into with that, being the head of the household of the Holy Family. When you look around in the room, and if something messed up, he's perfect. She's perfect. I wonder who messed up. He tried to divorce her quietly before the angel came to him. He traveled with his pregnant wife from where they were living in Nazareth to Bethlehem. He fleed for fear of Herod into Egypt. He lost Jesus in Jerusalem. I would say that that was a pretty big adventure. But the most amazing part is, is these are just the reports that we know in Scripture. We know that at one point, Jesus kind of went into these hidden years of His young life when He was about 12. We know that he, there was nothing written for about a span of 18 years. What was Joseph's role during that time? He taught Jesus how to be a craftsman. Teaching Jesus slowly at the table in the carpentry shop what it was to be a man. The foundation that Jesus had, His human foundation, His virtue, His honesty, his integrity, all those things were formed in him by his father in the workshop. He had his beauty. Mary. He had his beauty, who he was ready to fight to protect. He was ready to protect. He was ready to fight for. He was ready to lead. He was ready to guide. And he was so ready for her for her benefit, that he was also ready to learn from her. Mary had an intimacy with God that no human being has ever had before and has ever had since. And Joseph was able to be in the front row learning from her how to pray. What real intimacy with God looked like. The depths of it. His battle. He had a life of gift. He was constantly giving. He was constantly giving. And he was completely chaste. He was completely chaste in his continued gift to the Holy Family. 
knowing that Mary wasn't His. Knowing that in a way Jesus wasn't His. But continuing, despite all of that, to give and to give and to give. He was that quiet father. The head of his household. That despite his adventure, his beauty, and his battle looking a little bit differently, still led to a full life. Brothers, each one of us today is being called by our Lord in some way to purify one of those aspects of our life. If it's the adventure, where in your adventure with God do you need to be guided? What does is, what is regular, everyday holiness look like in your life? If it's with your beauty, how is it that I can lay down my life better for the beauty that God has entrusted me? Wife, kids, our church, whoever it is, what beauty in my life is God calling me to love better? To love in a more sacrificial way? In a battle? What battles in my life right now am I okay with losing? What battles in my life right now is that <coughs> I've just let defeat me? And what battles in my life does God want me to be willing to face? Every one of us is called in some way tonight to answer one of those ways. To be a little bit more committed to our relationship with God in one of those ways. I don't know about you, but if the normal, everyday, Sunday Christian sitting in his church is bored, they don't know about this adventure, this battle, and this beauty. They don't know what it looks like to live that and to strive for that kind of life that's fulfilling in those ways, in those places. Tonight, as I said at the beginning, we have the opportunity of confession. If any of this has welled up anything in your heart, go to a priest. Offer it back to God. Be healed where we can be healed so that we can live that life more effectively. I want to close um, with a short litany of saints. Um, there's a document that has gone around before <coughs> that if y'all need, I can, I can email it to y'all. It's called Into the Breach. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a challenge by Bishop Olmsted to the men of his diocese in Phoenix. It's a beautiful document that really speaks to the heart of a lot of these things. Recognizing that in our world, there's a lack of manhood. I, said, I listed all those different, those different icons, cultural icons for us. We've had a lot less Han Solos and Luke Skywalkers and those kind of nice, like awesome battling kind of people. We've got a lot more Homer Simpsons in our world today. Goofy, drunk, fat, tired, bored. Into the Breach is a document that really does a fantastic job of challenging men where we need to be challenged. So if you want, I can pass that on uh, to y'all and I'll, uh, we'll get it out to you. Just as something to reflect and to pray with going forth from here. But before we jump into adoration, I just want to close with a quick prayer. Uh, in that document, they highlight a couple of saints. So we made a little litany out of it. So we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For your trust, St. Joseph, pray for us. For your humility, St. John the Baptist. Pray for, us. for your adherence to truth, St. Paul. Pray for, us. for your prayer and devotion, St. Benedict. Pray for, us. for your witness of happiness, St. Francis of Assisi. Pray for, us. for your integrity, St. Thomas More. 
for your chastity, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, for your boldness, St. Jose Maria Escriva, for your defense of the weak, Pope St. John Paul II. Our fathers, chained in prison dark, were still in heart and conscience free. How sweet would be their children's fate if they like them could die for Thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death.